Good morning. It's wonderful for you to join us this morning on our Heart of Westmoreland Mission Community Service. The Lord be with you. Throughout this month, we're going to see a lot more of our churches reopening. Um, and so there's going to be, I guess, less people uh, having that same necessity to engage with our services online. However, there's still lots of people who we find aren't going to be going to services anytime soon. We're going to be finding ourselves in quite a mixed economy, really. Finding people coming to church in, in uh, places like the Sands here, or at Dufton, or at Moreland Parish, uh, and Appleby Parish. There are many churches that we serve throughout this mission community, many who are taking slightly different approaches to this epidemic. We don't really have a clear-cut answer to each individual situation. And isn't that just what church is about? And what we find ourselves in all our lives, not just in the coronavirus epidemic. We are going to worship together, wherever we are, whoever we are, for we are all united in Christ. So let us sing our first hymn together, in Christ alone.
Thank you to the sand singers for singing that for us. We're going to come to a time of prayer now and find ourselves united in our prayers to Christ. Let's pray. God of love, generous and kind, faithful to us in all generations, we are so glad to worship you this morning, to come to you, and grateful for what you have given us, each new day being a gift from yourself to us. Lord, in this time we pray for our churches and each person coming to a church, keep them safe as they go to worship you. For those who aren't coming to church this morning, we pray that you will meet with them powerfully by your spirit and that feeling of the communion of saints being surrounding uh, surrounding us all being intimately known by each person Lord we think of ourselves this morning where our hearts are the burdens that we have accumulated we pray that you might make us new, release us from our sins, unload our backs from our burdens. We trust in your forgiveness, that you will make us clean. And we pray that you will renew the right spirits within us, make us more into the likeness of Christ Jesus. As we come to worship you today, may we, you, may we know your presence in whatever situation we are finding ourselves in. And we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour. 
Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us live honourably, as in the day, not in revelling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarrelling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Today's reading from Romans chapter 13 is sandwiched between chapter 12, where Paul instructs his readers and listeners on what it means to live in God's service, and chapter 14, where he speaks about not judging one another. Of course, it's us who've split up Paul's letter into different topics, whereas he himself wrote it as a continuity. So, in the lead up to the passage set for today, Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you should. And remember that we're all part of one body with different functions and abilities. And also, he says, the love we show should be completely sincere. We should respect each other, work hard, not be lazy and serve the Lord with with a heart full of devotion. As was often the case with Paul, what he then writes becomes more difficult. Don't pay a wrong for a wrong. Never take revenge. Bless those who persecute you. If your enemies are hungry, feed them, conquer evil with good. Everything he says is laying the ground for what he wants us who are listening to understand about living the Christian life. So he begins the first seven verses which lead up to today's reading by pointing out the obligations to those in power. He says, state authorities have been put in that position by God and you should obey them. In other words, be a good citizen, obey the laws, and pay your taxes. But, and this is where our reading begins, he effectively says, here's a summary of how this is all going to be put into practice. He says, be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another because all the commandments are summarized in the one command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Here Paul is referring to the formation of the command in the book of Leviticus. We tend to think of this commandment as originating in the Old Testament, partly because Jesus re-expressed it in a different way, which made God more central to the commandment, but we'll come back to that in due course. However, the commandment expressed in Leviticus was simply the Jewish expression of a principle that was known in the ancient world. It's now referred to as the golden rule or the golden law, and the first known expression of it appears in the story of the eloquent peasant, dating to Egypt about 4,000 years ago. And about 1,500 years ago, there's a papyrus which contains, also from Egypt, a negative affirmation of the golden rule, that which you hate to be done to you, do not do to another. In a Sanskrit text from about 800 BC, there's the injunction, treat others as you treat yourself. And in ancient Greece, sometime around the fourth century BC, Isocrates wrote, do not do to others that which angers you when they do it to you. Finally, it's found in many other religions, but not least of all in Islam, wish for your brother what you wish for yourself or love your brother as you love yourself. Particularly, you should forgive and overlook Do you not like God to forgive you? And Allah is the merciful forgiving. In other words, for thousands of years, human beings have been giving expression to the idea that we should love our neighbour as we love ourselves. But then, how do we say who our neighbour actually is? Jesus was confronted with that very question when the teacher of law, keen to know how to attain eternal life, asks him, who is my neighbour? Now, you would have thought that 2,000 years ago, the answer might be quite obvious. Well, no. Going back to the first teachers of the law, Jewish scholars of the Old Testament and others, have never agreed on exactly who an Israelite's neighbour actually was or is. For some, it simply meant children of your people. For others, even more exclusively, 
it refers to good Jews or good law observing Jews. When Jesus, in trying to draw an answer from his listeners, tells them the story of the Good Samaritan, he knows that many of his listeners would rather run a mile than recognise that a Samaritan was his or her neighbour. As a young man, Paul would undoubtedly have thought much the same. So by the time he wrote the letter to the Romans, we can see just how far his thinking had been changed by living out the principles within his understanding of the Christian life. We know that Jesus picked up and and elaborated love your neighbour in his parables and in his teaching and his healing. He did it by emphasising in part how people should behave to each other and to the less advantaged in society. For Jewish religious leaders of his time, this was far too revolutionary, even though the principles were clearly laid out in the Old Testament, which they knew so well. So who exactly is my neighbour, they cried. Who am I supposed to look after? What are you saying that I'm not doing so I can tell you I'm doing it because I'm following the law? For the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the beginning was the law, the way things were done and always had been done. Jesus and the religious leaders had quite different ideas about what love your neighbour actually meant. What the law referred to was how one Jew should treat another, not how they should treat every other human, whether Jew or Gentile. But what Jesus did was to take the two parts of the law and string them together. Love God, commandment, and love your neighbour as yourself, a pairing that became a central theme of the New Testament. It comes in Matthew and all the Gospels, in Romans, Galatians, James. One commentary which discusses these passages remarks that there's a long Christian tradition of understanding the first commandment, love God, to be fulfilled in the second, love your neighbour. And Paul can be sure that when he refers to the commandment, love your neighbour, he can expect his audience to understand that loving God comes first. And all that he writes comes back to how we express our love for God. And it's in loving our neighbour as ourselves. What we have then is a kind of circle or a triangle, if you like, whereas we love God, so we love our neighbour, so we love God. What seems such a simple arrangement turns out in human terms to be so difficult. After all, if we all held that truth universally, no matter what our religion, would it not be impossible to take revenge, to exercise the death penalty, to mutilate someone as punishment, to steal, to covet? In fact, all the other commandments would be covered by just that one. That's why Jesus illustrates what he meant through the story of the Good Samaritan. The key problem for the Jewish leaders then, as it is still today for us, is that we tend to look on people who are perhaps needy or don't have enough clothes to wear or different customs or priorities from us or somehow different from us as the other. We're almost conditioned into believing there's a level of normality and that's where we fit. In other words, We look for people who look just like us. What lies at the root of our problem, as it was 2000 years ago, is how we respond to difference. It seems that human beings often need to have some other with whom to be in conflict. If we encounter something which draws attention to the differences between us, it can develop into a barrier that separates us. Part of the problem that religious leaders of Jesus' time had with him apart from the fact that he's actually highly high critical of them, was that his teaching, his attitudes, his way of living even, was totally different from theirs. His teaching was so radical that it seems that they couldn't actually realise that it was different only from theirs in the emphasis it gave to the relationship between God and his people. All they could perceive was that he was, uh, he was opposed to them and their livelihoods and what they understood as the key tenets of their faith. Sometimes it seems that we don't recognise difference for what it is, and that it can teach us something, give us a better understanding of what we thought we knew. We have seen in our own time how religious differences, differences of colour, differences in sexuality, create barriers to mutual understandings being achieved between people we see as being different from us. Because we do erect these barriers, Often subconsciously, we can fail to treat people as equals. 
And I don't have to remind you that the news is full of it. What was revolutionary about Jesus' teaching, which Paul inherited and which we have inherited, and what makes it still profoundly relevant today is that it got to the very heart of such issues. When Jesus says, love God and love your neighbour, he's stating a very simple but incredibly profound truth that, to be honest, has troubled Christians and non-Christians alike down the ages, just as his use of the Samaritan did in the well-known story. It's easy to love our friends and maybe our neighbours too, unless they happen to be too noisy, of course. It's harder, but still quite possible to love God. But how do we love those that are antagonistic to us, those that steal from us, those who bully our children or worse? Going a bit wider, how do we love those who say God doesn't exist or deny the Holocaust happened or who have different religious beliefs from us or whose culture is completely different from ours? or those whose lifestyle seems to us to be immoral in some way, according to what we think of as being truly moral or truly spiritual or truly right and just. We cannot just ignore the less palpable ideas that lie behind these new te Old Testament and New Testament writings, which are summarised, if you like, by Jesus' words, love God and love your neighbour. Perhaps we become blind to knowing that we have gaps in our ability to love others and to look behind the rhetoric, behind the news, to the real individual stories of need, to injustice and so on, the plight of the individual and not just, maybe, not even the group. In the end, it does us good to have to stop and think about passages such as these, the Romans, Romans uh, where Paul exposes this commandment to those that he's writing exactly because we don't always interrogate our own attitudes and feelings. Love for others is expressed in many ways. And we, just as we know those times when we, when we be less loving, we do, we know when our actions have been generated by an expression of love, even although we might never know what benefits, what direct positive consequences followed from our actions. Jesus ends the story of the Good Samaritan by asking, and who was the neighbour to the man in need? And they reply, the one who helped him, to which Jesus responds, OK, so go and do the same.
looks like the ducks are joining me. Um, thank you to Richard for that wonderful um, sermon that you brought to us. This year, um, as a Methodist people, we're going to be thinking about what it is to what it is to look forward into the future. We are having a year of prayer, and I see no reason why this can't be a more ecumenical uh, thing that we engage with. But um, the idea is to pray for our churches, ourselves, but to specifically also pray for breakthrough. And the church has given us a, a prayer to do that with. Um, we are going to really be looking at this prayer um, as a Methodist people. And we are going to be thinking about what it means for us in the future. How we go forward, how we go into the um, coming year. It's quite a, um, a short prayer. And I'm going to pray as we pray our intercessory prayers this morning. So let's pray. God of love. God for all. Your purposes are more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us let go of all that holds us back. Open our lives and our churches to new seasons of humility and faith, of change and growth. Shake us up with the good news of Jesus and show us the way. Amen. God, we thank you that you are God that listens, that you are God that changes us and shakes us up. We pray for our world and our church and the people who live in our communities. We think of the leaders who are trying to discern the right way to act with this current crisis of coronavirus. We pray for continued wisdom. We pray for challenge uh, where it needs to be uh, to challenge, where people's lives are being uh, devalued because of um, political preferences or personal preferences. Lord, we also pray for our leaders in this country. We pray for Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister. I ask that you will guide and lead him and we make him, him take good and wise decisions. We pray for our government that will continue to try and make the right decisions and also the opposition who will challenge where it needs uh, to be challenged. We pray for our communities here in this area of Westmoreland, of Eden. We pray for the people who are currently um, having to stay at home, isolating. Ask that you will continue to be with them, that the community will be able to support them, that they will get what they need and provided for. And we also pray for those who might be worried about jobs at this time, who are either looking for jobs or worried about losing them. We pray that you will be with them and that you will continue to uh, support them and make all their needs provided for. We pray for the schools that are going back and have gone back in this last week. Ask that you'll continue to keep the children and the teachers safe, but also that there will be an environment where they can be enrichment and learning and growth. And Lord, we pray for each and every one of us, the people on our hearts this morning. Ask that you'll be with them. For those people who are hurting, we pray for healing. For those people who are bereaved, we pray for comfort. For those people who feel troubled, we pray that you will grant them your peace. We ask all these prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, as I stand by the river in Appleby, you can see where I am now. We're going to say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. God bless today.